Father God, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for all your grace. Thank you for all your mercy. Thank you for all the peace and all the joy that you've made available to us through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. We say thank you. Thank you, Lord. For the certainty of our salvation. We say thank you. Thank you, Lord. That our future is secure. We say thank you. Thank you, Lord. We pray, God, now that you move anything out of the way that would hinder us from hearing from you. Fears, doubts, confusion, sorrow, pain. Move it out of the way right now that we may be prepared to hear from you. God, move the priest out of the way and all of his frailty and all of his weakness. Fill him up, Holy Spirit, that your word may take life in this sanctuary. That when we leave this place, we will leave with the knowledge of your good and perfect will in our lives. Speak to us, Lord, that burdens may be moved. Speak to us, Lord, that shackles and chains may be broken. Speak to us, Lord, that the fog of confusion and doubt, Lord, would no longer affect us. Speak to us, Lord, that we will no longer be mad about nothing, but we will be happy and joyful about everything. Speak to us, Lord, that we may lay aside some stuff that we carried around so long. Speak to us, Lord, that we may be liberated to live the life you called us to live in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we say thank you and amen. Let's give God one more strong praise right now. For all have been better than God. If you know God has been good, you give him some strong praise. Give him some hallelujah praise. Give him some Got your Bible. Go ahead to the book of Romans right here. I've been, I've been waiting to preach since about six o'clock. Ready now. In the book of Romans, chapter eight, you're having to get that. Say amen when you get that. It's going to be on the screen in a minute, just a second. The book of Romans, chapter eight. You've seen this before, but I've been praying. I couldn't, couldn't hardly relax last night. The Lord showed me something for us. This is for St. Peter. If you're here today, this is for you. This is for us. Book of Romans chapter 8. We're still walking with a purpose. We're still learning about walking with a purpose. Book of Romans chapter 8. If you just say amen loud. Amen. Let me just slide down to the 26th verse. Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. But verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Y'all got to let us read that one more time. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Oh, tell, look your neighbor now, just one second. And say, neighbor, yeah. it's time to go, time to go. From, not from not knowing to knowing to know. what God wants from me. Wants from me. Amen. God bless yeah. you. God bless you. The journey from no, not knowing to knowing. Over the last few weeks, oh, we have sojourned in trying to grab our arms and our minds, our finite minds around the reality that God called us for a purpose. We uh, were not called randomly. We were not called willy-nilly. We were not called just to be called, but God called us for a purpose. And what we've learned and what we've come to understand as we've studied the scriptures is, first of all, that God has a good purpose or a good plan for our lives. 
Y'all remember the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah told us that. He said, God has a good plan for you. You may think that it's going bad, but God has a pleasant and a good outcome on the other end of your life. You may have to go through some battles, but God has a mountaintop experience and he has waited on every one of his people. Then we learned not only does God have a good plan or a good purpose for our lives, but we also began to learn the reality that when God has a plan, can't nobody change it. How many know God can't? God, God's plans can't be changed. Can I tell somebody right there? The economy can't change God's plans. The, whoever the president is can't change God's plan. What, whatever uh, you, you are going through, it can't outline, it can't determine, it can't change, it can't derail what God has for you. And, and then we learn that God's plans have power. Somebody said they got power. They're, in other words, it may look like something's in the way, but if you know what God's plan and purpose is, you can already rest assured that God can knock over whatever impediment stands in your way. I want to take a station break and tell somebody, the enemy may be trying to tell you that God can't do it, but I want you to know that the enemy it has no say-so in what God has declared for your life. The enemy can't stop God. God controls and has power over everything. Folk may line up against you, but when God declared to be so, guess what? It's all already done. Somebody, somebody hold on that. It's already done. It's already so. It may, may look challenging to you, but God doesn't see it the way we see it. God sees it from a whole nother perspective. Last, last, just a couple of weeks ago, we were in the book of Philippians, and we were reminded in the book of Philippians chapter 2 that while God is working on us, we ought to be working on it. In other words, it, it's not it's, it's that, that sacred moment when the children of God are fully engaged in trying to do what God has called us to do, that God is able to work on us to bring about his ultimate plan for our lives. Can I say it again? In other words, God is working on the inside while we are working on the outside, and that's when the change comes for your life. You, you, you can't stand still and say, God, fix me if you're not willing to put yourself into the process of God fixing you. Can I tell somebody, as dirty as your car is, your God, God will never get clean if you don't put it somewhere where it can get washed on the outside. You, can I tell somebody this right here? I want to talk about this right here. Some of y'all have seen my car. It is white, but it's still, it, it, it's, it's still brown, and the other truck is black, but it's still quite because it, it's not in a place so it can be cleaned on the outside but when that moment comes where I want them to be clean guess what I have to move from where I am to where they can be clean and I say the same thing about the child of God today you got to stop sitting down and hoping God fixes you and get up and get in position so God can have his way and do what he has already outlined for your life you can't sit on this you got to get up and get the work on it Today, as we show our brief in the book of Romans chapter 8, we see three verses that we, most of us, have been in church many period of time and read countless times. But I pray today God will open up these verses so that we may see what's really going on. Somebody tell you, Nick, I want to see what's really going on. Hey, go, go ahead, let's, let's evaluate chapter, chapter 8, verse 26. In chapter 8, as the Holy Spirit moves Paul, he's moved to a high place. He begins chapter 8 after he has, after he has shared in chapter 5 the beauty of our salvation that we are justified by faith. In chapter 6, he takes a moment and begins to discuss the realities of our salvation. But not only that, he was discussing the reality of our weakness in our flesh. In chapter 7, he lets us know there's a wrestling match going on. Uh, there's, a, there's a spirit man versus a flesh man. And we're not careful to feed the spirit man. The flesh man will do what? He'll pin the spirit man. So we have to be careful to allow the spirit man to grow through our prayer, and through our study of the scripture, through our praise, through our worship, so that the spirit man won't get count in a, in a three count to the flesh man. He talks about that in chapter 7. But when he gets to chapter 8, he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, the Holy Spirit. Somebody ought to, ought to be glad. How many glad about the Holy Holy Spirit today. And, and, and chapter 8, he begins to talk about the Holy Spirit. That we, that, that, that the stuff we can't do, the Holy Spirit will do. The stuff we can't figure out, the Holy Spirit will explain to us. The stuff we can't do on our own, guess what? The Holy Spirit will elevate us and allow us to do that which called us to do. He begins to talk about the Holy Spirit. And when he gets here to chapter 26, chapter 8, verse 26, 
He begins this, this process of unraveling for the Christian in reality to what God's purpose is, but how it's accomplished in us and how we know what's taking place. Look at verse 26. He says, likewise. Whenever he says, you see likewise in the Bible, that means he's referring back to a previous version. He's referring back to verse 25 and verse 24 when he establishes for the Christian that we are saved by hope. In other words, what is the foundation of our salvation, the promises of God? And we begin to understand as Christians that our salvation is not one-dimensional, but it is in fact three-dimensional. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Can I say that one more time? When you accept Christ as your Savior, you are saved. What? You are saved from the penalty of sin in your life. What did the Bible say? The wage of sin is what? Yeah. But the gift of God is what? Yeah. Eternal life. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you are, in fact, saved from the penalty of sin. And then you are in the process, all of us are saved, are in the process of now of being delivered from the power that sin has had over us. In other words, when you were not saved, sin had total authority over your life. But as a result of our salvation, guess what? As we trust God, sin has less and less and less influence over us. Okay, let me put it, put it, put it like this. How many of us since you've been saved, stuff you used to do, you don't want to do as much as you want to do? All right, let me, let me do another poll. How many of us since you've been saved, stuff that used to hold you back now doesn't have that same hold on you since you've been saved? Because God is in the process of allowing you to be free from the stuff that used to hold you back. But one day soon, one, one day soon, when it's all over down here, one day soon when Jesus has cracked the sky, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. In other words, sin won't be anywhere around us when we're in the presence. I wish I had somebody happy about that. When we're in the presence of God, sin won't be there. Sin will be left behind. And because sin will be gone, there'll be no more sorrow. Because can I tell somebody, sin causes sorrow. When sin is left behind, there'll be no more sickness. Why? Because sin causes sickness. When we're in the presence of God, there'll be no more sin and we'll be completely saved. Now here's what Paul is trying to tell us. Now, because of that reality, because of that process of our salvation, we live Christians in expectation of that day when we fully move out of this world into the presence of God where there's no more sin. Now, moving forward to verse 26, he says, now, keeping that same thought process in mind, he said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because he says, also helpeth our infirmities. Now, how many of us can be honest and say that even when we do our best, we weak? When you you weak, I don't, I don't care how long you've been in the church, don't care how fancy your suit is, don't care how many times you come to the building. There's still some weakness. Why? Because we are in these old fleshly bodies. And, and, and so what Paul is trying to explain to us is we sometimes get depressed. Sometimes we get despondent. Sometimes we get disappointed because we are so weak in the flesh. But Paul says, do not despair because you have help that's already there. In other words, Paul said, ain't saying help is on the way. Paul said, if you're a child of God, help is already right there. You know, I wish I had somebody to see that right there. When you're a child of God, you're not calling 911 to get the Holy Spirit to come to you. When you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit is already right <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We're weak, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. How many of us, I want to, let's do it like this. How many of us, as we have sojourned in our Christian lives, have we sometimes felt that what we were doing wasn't enough? How many of us, as we have sojourned in our Christian lives, sometimes say, am I doing the right, am I on the right path? Am I going the right way? Because it seems like stuff keep happening. Anybody remember me that right now? Somebody, somebody, some of us right here, and I'm, I'm talking turkey. Now some of us, in our Christian lives, we, we, we get frustrated because we wonder, if what we did well, is going to affect what we're about to do. Paul says, no, 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 this man. He said, because the Spirit helps our infirmities, helps us in our weakness. Paul, tell us how. Look what he says. For we know. This is verse 26. Watch this now. For, for we know what, not what, we should pray for as we are. How about that? 
Paul said, Paul said, I've been around a long time. I've been, I've been some places. He said, God struck me down blind. I came to the Lord. I, I've had some successes. I've had some failures. I've had some ups. I've had some downs. Paul said, what I do know is that I, Christian, and all Christians don't know what we should pray for. Look what he says, as we ought. In other words, he said, Christians, you may think you know what to pray for. But the reality is, not only do you not know what to pray for, you don't know how to pray for what you ought to be praying for. In other words, he's saying, you, you think you got it, but what's really going on is in your frailty, because of the frailty of your flesh, you are not asking for the right things, and even when you got the right thing, you're asking for it in the wrong way. Now again, don't, don't quit. Now don't, don't walk off right here in this part of it. He's just sharing this, letting us know that this is what's happening. It's not that God is not hearing prayers, not God tripping. It's just sometimes in our flesh, we don't even know what to ask for. And as a result, sometimes we get frustrated in prayer. I, I got to talk turkey today because I believe the Lord wants somebody to be healthy. Paul said, don't get frustrated when you pray. So I've heard this happen. Pastor, I've been praying, ain't nothing happening. Well, maybe not. But then again, maybe it is. But you're just looking at it from the wrong perspective. Maybe nothing is happening, but maybe, in fact, as you have toiled in prayer, as you sweated in prayer, as you got up early in the morning and called on God, maybe you didn't see nothing happening, but maybe you didn't know what to look for. Let's go a little further. For we know not what we should pray for as we all, but something happens. But the Spirit makes intercession for us. Can I talk about intercession just for a moment? Intercession is when somebody comes between two people to help the process of communication. All right, so let's say for example, Deacon Slaughter and Deacon Thomas trying to talk and they're not getting, they're not communicating. They might say, Pastor Thomas, come here. And I might tell, say, what you say now, Deacon Slaughter? He tell me, I said, Deacon Thomas, this is what he's trying to say. And then Deacon Thomas said, oh, okay, I get it now. I didn't know what he was trying to say. He turned back. I said, well, this is what Deacon Thomas trying to say. And all of a sudden, guess what? The gap is closed because they have now what? They have had intercession. Can I tell somebody that we have an intercessor and then we have somebody who's making an intercession for us. First of all, if you are a child of God, you have an intercessor. Can I tell you his name? His name is Jesus because he lives to make intercession for, I wish I had somebody excited about that. Uh, my intercessor didn't, didn't go uh, and get a degree in an MBA or a counselor degree. My intercessor sits at the right hand of the Father and lives to make intercession for me. But even if that's not enough, guess what? The Holy Spirit at the same time is, is doing some work on my behalf. Oh, let's dig a little deeper here. Y'all gonna stop there. The Spirit make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Can I tell somebody, sometimes when you are on your knees and you are praying and won't nothing come out, it doesn't mean that nothing's happening. It just means nothing coming out of your mouth. But that's when the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit's moving in and tears are running down your cheek and, and you're, you're feeling heavy but the Holy Spirit gets involved and, and gets down in your heart and begins to move and, and begin to testify on your behalf to the Father what's in your heart. Thank you, we gotta go one more level down. Now, Here's where it gets real good. That, that, that was good right there, wasn't it? But it gets better in verse 27. I, I, I used to stop at verse 26 and clap my hands, but now verse 27 takes me a whole nother level. Now, look at verse 27. Now, he, the Holy Spirit, that searches the hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Time out. This is where sometimes we get a tad bit confused. But it's really not confusing. It's just beautiful. Because what we see in verse 27 is that the Holy Spirit is searching the hearts. Whose heart? Oh, we could say. Well, he's searching our hearts. The Holy Spirit is searching our hearts. 
to make a determination about something that we can't say on our own, but God knows for a fact. I tell somebody, how many times have you ever heard somebody say, you know, only God knows the heart? Yeah. Anybody heard the raise hand if you ever heard that? You may think you know, but God knows the heart. Can I tell somebody, God does know the heart? But God don't know the heart just from back in the past. God knows your heart right now. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is making intercession in your heart to determine whether you are trying to do the will of God or not. Now, now hold on. Let me go one more level down. He searches the hearts. He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Now, and for the longest time, I was stuck right here. But then I went back to chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Can I, can I read that just one second? Chapter 8, verse 5 and 6 says this. For they that are after the flesh do the things of the flesh. They do mind the things of the flesh. That means if people say, I'm just going to do what I want to do, guess what? They do what they want to do. On the other hand, but they that are after the spirit, they do what? The things of the spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes if you have a heart and a mind to do the will of God, you won't fall. But it does mean that if you are trying and you have a heart to be obedient to God, guess what? The Spirit will reign in your life. But if you just decide that whatever I do is what I do and I'm going to please myself, guess what? You're going to be stuck in your flesh. Now, as I read this verse, and then I went on here in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is what? But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Now, I flipped back over. I, I read that and went back over here to verse 27 and I began to understand what is the mind of the Spirit. Here's what the Holy Spirit is looking for. The Holy Spirit is searching our hearts to determine whether or not we are inclined to follow God or inclined to follow our flesh. In other words, if you are inclined to follow your flesh, the Holy Spirit will make a report back to God and say, don't mess with them, they ain't trying to do nothing right now, no way. But if you've got a heart for God, even if you tripped up, even if you have fallen, even if you have messed up, the Holy Spirit makes a report back to God and say, Father, he's with us. He just had some hard times. Father, he's, she's with us. She's just going through something. But, but because they really tried to do your will, you can go ahead and adjust where they are. Can I tell somebody, sometimes when God makes a way out of no way, it ain't because you're so good, it's because God is so good, but it is because you have a heart for God. One more step. And he that searched the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh the intercession for the saints. Now here's where the, this is where the, the second part of it. When the Holy Spirit is made intercession, okay? When he's made intercession and, and reports to God, they, are, they, they got a heart for you. They're trying. They really, truly are following you. Then the report is made. And then the intercession is made for the saints. That's the folk who got the hearts for God according to the will of God. That means that God says, okay, I see they're over here. And I'm over here. But because they try, what I'm going to do is make an adjustment. I'm going to shift them from where they are to where over here where I need them to be. Where they can get what I'm trying to get. Where they can go where I'm trying to get them to go. And, and so sometimes, and this way it is, sometimes in your life, when God makes a course correction, it may hurt for a little while. But the good news is God is trying to get you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And so even though it may hurt, you ought to live and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me. It hurt a little bit, but I thank you for giving me back on path. Yeah, I got chastised, but I feel good because you love me enough to get me back on point. Thank you. Now, this world that we live in is a strange place. Peter said, we're strangers. He said, we're soldiers in a foreign land. And then that means that sometimes we have to go through some stuff that, that hurts us. Sometimes we've got to endure some pain, but I want you to know that if you're a child of God, you never have to worry about God having left you. Well, I hear the words that he'll never leave you. 
He'll never forsake you. He'll, he'll, he'll never turn his back on you. He'll, he'll never say, no, not right now. And, and, and because we know that there's intercession being made for us, then there's something else we begin to know. Look at verse 26. It says, we don't know how to pray. But because of the Holy Spirit knows our hearts, guess what? We find out something in verse 28 that we got to know to live in victory in this world. Paul says, and we know. Who knows, Paul? All the folk who got a heart for God. Paul said, and we know. Paul, who knows? Everybody who has laid aside their own will and has decided to submit to the will of God. Paul said, we know. Who knows, Paul? Folks who don't count it a problem to come to Bible study and say, let me see what thus says the Lord. Paul said, we know. Paul, who knows? Somebody that doesn't mind lifting up hands when nothing going on and saying, thank you, Lord. Paul said, and we know. Who knows, Paul? Person who declared with their mouth that Jesus died for me and that God raised him from there and to believe in their heart. Paul says, we no, Paul, who knows? Paul said the folk who don't mind trying their very best to do what the Lord has told them to do. Paul says, we know, Paul, who knows? The folk who are not satisfied being part-time Christians, but who always want to be engaged in doing the work of the Lord. Paul says, we know, Paul, who knows? The person who said today is my best day yet because I'm going to follow God all the way. Paul says, we know, Paul, who knows? The person who gets up in the morning and says, God, order my steps. Because this is the day you have made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Paul said, and we know Paul who knows the person who gets down on his knees late in the midnight hour and calls on the name of the Lord. Paul said, and we know Paul who knows the person who does not deny Jesus but declares that Jesus is my Savior. Paul said, we know. Paul said, we know. When it's going good, we know. When it's going bad, we still know. When we're up on the high mountain, we know. When we're down in the dark valley, we know. When we're in the midday hour, we know. But we're in the late in the midnight hour, we still know. When the storms of life are raging, we know. But when the sun is on our back, we still know. Paul, what it is should we know? Paul said, we know that all things, See, when you're a child of God and it's hard, the Spirit of God has searched your heart and it testified to God that you got a heart for God, you begin to know some stuff. You begin to know that even though you lost your job, that God still going to make a way out of nowhere. You begin to know that even though you might not have a dime in your pocket, you begin to know that God is going to make a way for me and that one day soon I'm going to get my increase. You know and even though your heart is heavy, you know that God is going to lift your burden. And he's going to give you your joy back. You know. We know that all things, they begin to work together. And I wish I had somebody could understand the concept of working together. When you work it together, you may not be able to get it together. But when God works it together, God can put it all together. Can I tell somebody that God can take your good, God can take your bad, and God can take your ugly, and God can take all of that stuff, and He can mix that stuff up, and He can turn it out all right, because that's how God is. Well, I'm going to tell you a story you may be familiar with, but I want to help somebody understand what all things work together for the good really mean for your life. But when I was a little boy, I was in the kitchen, and Mama was making a cake. And she had taken all the ingredients out and lined them up on the counter. She had a little pinch of salt. She had a little sugar, had a little flour. She had all the ingredients to make a cake lined up on the counter. And I was used to put my finger in the cake mix. But I decided that day, I put my finger in the ingredients. I wet my finger and put my finger in the salt, and I said, mmm, that don't taste good. And I wet my finger and put in the flour, and I said, mmm, that don't taste good. And I wet my finger and put in the butter, and it would have looked better, but it still didn't taste good. And I went back in my room saying, cake so don't taste good. 
But when mama came in the kitchen, she took all those ingredients. She began to mix a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And she began to mix it all up. And she cracked the egg and put it in and mixed it up some more. And after a while, when she got everything mixed up just right, she put it in a cake pan and she put the cake pan in the oven. And when she, I came back into the kitchen, I took my finger and I rubbed it all around the bowl. And I put my finger in my mouth. I said, cake sure tastes good. And I stopped by here to tell somebody that what God can do is he can take a little bit of this, he can take a little bit of that, but he can mix it right on up and it might not look good to you, but it'll taste good to you when God mixes it up. Good afternoon, St. Peter, but I want you to know that when you're a child of God, God will work things together for the good of them that love him. But I want to tell you, you got to love him every day and every hour of the day. You can't just love him on Sunday and expect God to work it out. You got to love him on Sunday. You got to love him on Monday. You got to love him on Tuesday. You got to love him on Wednesday. You got to love him on Thursday. And you got to love him on Friday. You got to love him on Saturday. And surely, you got to love him enough to get up Sunday morning before you get to church. Lift those hands up and say, I thank you, Lord, before I get to church. I thank you, Lord, before I get in my car. I thank you, Lord, before I cut my car on. Because no matter what they say, you so been good to me. You got to love the Lord when it's going good. And you got to love the Lord when it's going bad. You got to love the Lord when your pockets are full. But you got to love the Lord when your pockets are empty. But if you love the Lord, He will. He will. He will. He will. He will work it together according to His purpose. That means that when you love the Lord, He's working for you. And when you're out of place, He'll put you back in place. And after a while, after a while, one step, one step, one step, one step, one step, you will look up and you'll be where God wants you to be. Ain't God all right? Ain't God all right? Won't He take you? Won't He move you? Won't He pick you up? Won't He turn you around? Won't He put your feet on solid ground? I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad that God will move me. Thank you, Lord. I was way over there, but you put me here. Thank you, Lord. I was down, but you picked me up. Thank you, Lord, that you've been so good. Has it been good to you? Just wave your hand and say, thank you, Lord. Say, thank you, Lord. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Because I know that God will. He will. He will. He will. He will. Make every thing. All right. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he make everything? Everything. All right. on God. Every time the Holy Spirit searches, he'll come back with a good report. And as long as we got that good report to God and say, God, I'm trying. Guess what? God will. He'll work everything out. He will. How many know he will? How many can look back over your life? You look back over your life. And you may say, I didn't know who did this. I didn't know that. But when you look up, you say, Lord, here I am. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody didn't think, somebody right in this place, they didn't think you'd make it to marry you made it. But it wasn't because of you being good, it was because of God being great. 
And I'm telling somebody right now, don't despair because of where you are. Don't despair because of your situation. You just keep focusing on God. Keep focusing on God. The song said, the world behind me and the cross is where? Before me. I'm going to stop worrying about the world. I'm going to start focusing on the cross. Because it was at the cross. I wish I had somebody stop this. It was at the cross where I first, I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart just rolled away and it was down. received us. <laughs> and now, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy when it's good. I'm happy when it's bad. I'm happy not because of what's going on. I'm happy because of what happened for me at the God we serve. Oh, somebody here today, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Just hold on. Hold on. Because God will. He'll take care of you. But I have a witness that God will take care of you. Anybody witnesses? Witnesses that he'll take care of you. He's the battle axe. He's in the time of the battle. I mean, I mean, I may do it. Let me do a poll. How many know he's a chef in the time of the storm? How many know that? How many know he's a doctor? Somebody grab hold of that. He's a doctor in the sick room. He's a lawyer in the courtroom. He's he's a lily of the valley. That, that means when it's dark, you can see him. The bright and morning star. Don't trust nobody else. Just trust him. Trust. Him. Trust the Lord if you trust him and you got your heart bent toward him. Guess what? God will bend where you are toward you where he wants you to be. Let's give God praise today. Give God praise today. Give God praise today. If you know God is good, give him praise today. Every head by just just take a moment to contemplate. I don't care what you got going on. God is great. God is great. He's greater, he's greater, he's greater. Whatever you're going through, he's greater. Just contemplate right now. Take whatever you got and, and understand that whatever you got going on, God is greater than the sickness. God is greater than sickness. If it's economic, God is the greatest economic provider ever. Why you say that, Pastor? Because he's the only cattle on a thousand years. Holds the world in the palm of his hand. Everything moves by the power of his word. Whatever you're going through, God got it. Let's just trust him completely. Let's just trust him completely. Trust him totally. All you got to do is give yourself a little bit of him. Give him your best. Give him your all. And he'll take that stuff and work it together. He'll do it. He'll do it.
head bow for a moment. Every head bow, right? And this is the moment of this is it. There may be some who decide to come to Christ, but there may be some who are in Christ who decide to fully commit to him. Now, if this is your testimony, you say, Lord, I'm ready to give myself up to you. You can say that. The words that we provided, Lord, I give my all to you, Lord. I give you all of me. You can say it right where you are. I give you, Lord, I, I know I've kind of been, I'm kind of having at it, but I want to have all of you. You, you can be honest with God right now. You ain't got to come up here to say it, but you can say it right where you are, God. I've been kind of going after it, but I want to go after you. Don't go get so fixated in the way you're going that you forget who's taking you where you're going. Some of us want to jump and say, I want to make all these right decisions. But guess what? If you are connected to God, you're going to make the right decision because he's going to be leading you where he already wants you to go. Just, I just want to take this second moment. Don't nobody look at nobody. Just have a moment between you and God. You and God. This is a you and God moment. No moment. It's just make a decision to follow God. Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. He's here. He's here. You gotta go get him nowhere. He's here. You can say, Lord, I surrender all. I'm all of my wheel to your wheel. Changer. Paul said that. Paul, Paul said, I did all this stuff against the church, but then how God is so good that he brought me back to him. I want somebody to know, I don't care where you've been and what you've done, you're still not outside of the rage of God. I'm telling this right here, every head about somebody, I talked to somebody today, they said, I sure would like to get into the Lord and come into relationship with the Lord, but I've done so much. This way said, I've done so much, I can't, I can't, I, I just, I don't think I can pay it, pay it all back to God. So you know what? It's been paid for. Your salvation has been paid for. It's free to you. That's what I'm talking about. It's free right down there here in this ethics, ethics, ethics plaza. But it's been paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. So if you're in this building today and you said, I've done so much, I can't pay, guess what? God ain't looking for you to pay back. He's just looking for you to come just as you are. That's what he's looking for. He said, come just as you are. Bring all of your burdens. Bring all of your pride and your, your triumph and your, bring it all. Give it over to him. That's all he wants you to do. That's the payment. That's payment enough right there. Just give yourself, surrender yourself for the day.
place today who is standing in need of prayer. I'm particularly asking the sister Tammy Gilliam when we walk close to this altar right now. Give me a chat. Give me one, give me a prayer chat.